Uh, somebody who can give us a little bit of perspective on uh, what's going on uh, is um, Cameron Sinclair, who runs the organization Architecture for Humanity, which is one of the three uh, charities that um, Virgin Unite has uh, agreed Where are you to coming donate from? to, including also Oxfam so and not, UNICEF uh, to supply aid. I was just off the phone with Pakistan, so I have a pretty up-to-date uh, report on what's going on. All right. Well, why don't you? I, I feel I feel the uh, the tone is probably appropriately settling. Uh, if you could uh, maybe give us a little bit of uh, background on what you know, we have not actually uh, really talked much about what is going on over there um, or the history of what's going on. So maybe you could uh, give us some background. Well, I feel kind of bad because uh, I'm I'm sort of the coffee break for music lovers. But um, you know, we've been working in Pakistan. Um, for quite a while, we have a Karachi chapter, and our role is the reconstruction phase. So there are four phases in a post-disaster, and many of you guys have seen the images. Um, millions of people uh, displaced, uh, you know, and you have to think about not just the immediate needs, which you know Oxfam and UNICEF does an incredible job, but um, the recovery phase and the reconstruction phase. So. Uh, many people don't realize that while a disaster is in the news for a few weeks, it can take between four to six years to rebuild. So uh, we look at the long form uh, needs. Uh, so if, if you could, uh, so if, could you give just a little bit of history for those for those uh, folks, uh, including myself, who don't have. Uh, a terribly good understanding of, of every, everything that happened. Obviously, there's massive flooding, uh, but just what's kind of happened since, since the beginning of the flood, uh, what areas are, are, are still uh, being affected, and also how? What's, what, what kinds of situations uh, are, are people finding themselves in? Well, uh, I know there's a delay, so I'll try and be uh, slow. You know, the, the real issue is this is like a slow tsunami. Um, unlike many natural disasters that happen rapidly, uh, a flooding disaster can take days, weeks, uh, and sometimes months. Um, Pakistan has uh, had to deal with uh, this slow rise, which means that um, areas have become more and more displaced, which means people moved either south or north to get away from the flooding and then were caught in the crosshairs. So places like the Swat Valley is completely underwater. And um, while the flooding has not only destroyed you know, the season's crops for the following year um, and livestock, but also washed away uh, whole towns and villages. So the immediate uh, focus right now is to look at setting up camps up on dry land um, to deal with the food and shelter issues. And then we have to really figure out where to rebuild, if it's right to rebuild in areas that are continually affected by floods, and how to um, respond in a way that supports local uh, people. There is uh, a question came in from Matthew uh, McMinn. Uh, here, here, here it is. Have uh, have their, uh, assuming that he means uh, Pakistan, uh, the, the government of Pakistan, have their positions on terrorism and nuclear non-proliferation uh, affected media coverage and aid? Um, if you could respond to that. You know, that's a great question. Um, I, I Just after the disaster, I wrote a piece on the Huffington Post about uh, the relationship between terrorism and disasters. And um, I would say yes. I would say that many people are um, hesitant to go into a situation where you know that there's uh, extremism. But what we also have to bear in mind, and I don't want to seem like, uh, you know, a, a, a bearer of fear, but you know, what happened after the Kashmir earthquake was really hard for a lot of international NGOs because there was not the response uh, needed to rebuild. And who do you think rebuilds in rural communities that are highly financed and can reach communities? It's going to be extremist groups. So, you know, a lot of the...
extremist groups that are uh, the Pakistan government is supposed to be tackling are the ones that are funding the recovery efforts, you know, and that's just fact um, that we have to deal with. Um, you know, we as the international uh, community are going to do as much as we can. Um, our organization is actually focused on supporting uh, local Pakistani uh, professionals and builders because we believe that when you focus your funding locally, you support that goodwill. Um, so, yes, we have to address some of the uh, uh, terrorism issues, but they can be overcome by community-led reconstruction efforts rather than a top-down, because I think uh, most people don't like being told how to uh, recover and rebuild, but if you empower them, then you can circumnavigate the fear of um, uh, an embrace of uh, extremism. So it's a, it sounds like it's a it's a, a pretty complicated issue in the sense I I, uh, I think that probably you were referring to the fact that I I, I hear reports uh, maybe that the Taliban is starting to come in and offer uh, relief uh, even to the extent that they were they're threatening people uh, who who might be receiving aid from other organizations but I, I'm sure it's a, a pretty uh, mixed situation but it sounds to me that. Uh, uh, relief from the international community can only uh, can only do good in all these different facets. Uh, there's another question that's come in um, uh, from from the audience, and and, and I'm going to just kind of dovetail that into a larger question, which is uh, the question is from Alice G. Lingerfelt, and she said, "You had mentioned donor fatigue. How do you slash we encourage humanity to move beyond the fatigue?" And I'm just going to even uh, say, uh, you know, you have such uh, an amazing organization and come up with such uh, incredibly interesting and diverse ways of uh, helping communities. If you could uh, give us a little bit of the good news, uh, you know, what, what's going on, what you've tried, and some of the uh, things that uh, you're very, very hopeful about. That's a fantastic question. Uh, thank you, Alice, for that. Um, you know, when we talk about donor fatigue, a lot of it has to do with the fact that we as donors don't see the results. And there's a massive lack of transparency in the way that people are responding to disasters. You know, we as an organization are very nimble. So, um, funnily enough, a majority of our donors happen to be um, kids between 16 and 22. You know, they're high school, uh, early college. And they contact me on Facebook and um, on instant messenger and say, listen, I gave you five bucks, what did you do with it? And so we have to make sure that we built in a transparent system where people can see results all the time and there's tangible results. So whether it's building schools in Haiti or whether it's building medical clinics in Pakistan, you have to have visual transparency, both financially and also for people to see it. So if you say you're gonna build a school, show me a picture of the school being built, show me where the funds are going. And I knew that I'm going to be on with a lot of really good artists and I can neither sing um, and my drawing is not perfect. So I thought, as I'm the kind of scientist, um, I should have a handy dandy chart. So this is, I'm going to show a chart that kind of explains um, the other point about donor fatigue that is when you embrace and support the community, you can create an economic stability um, so here's my handy dandy chart. My so you, you get the funding and rather than just dumping it in the country, you actually support local professionals and, and, and the local capacity uh, with that funding. And then rather than just, you know, building one school with outside contractors and giving kind of no bid uh, contracts to these large firms, you actually support uh, um, the building of businesses. So whether it's small contractors and uh, people to uh, bring in the materials. So, you know, that one dollar actually um, eventually funds 20 or 30 people. And if you have that stream of funding, then um, you're embracing the whole community uh, rather than, um, you know, raising all this money, um, not having the capacity to build in country, and then going out and hiring some international contractor to do the work. because 
not only have people suffered, but that the number one thing that people want are jobs. So if we're not creating jobs locally, then you're not creating a sustainable method for reconstruction. And then we see failures, and then you get donor fatigue. So it's really our responsibility as NGOs to make sure that we're supporting those affected, but also giving them jobs so they can recover.